So on behalf of Partners in Project Green, I'd like to welcome you to our monthly series of green technology webinars. For those of you who might not know, Partners in Project Green, developed in partnership with Toronto and Region Conservation and the Greater Toronto Airports Authority, is a growing community of businesses working together to green their bottom line by creating an internationally recognized eco-business zone around Toronto Pearson. We offer many resources to help companies along their journey to sustainability. For more information on our programs, training, events, and much more, visit our website at www.partnersinprojectgreen.com. As for today's webinar, we're very fortunate to have Tim Van Cedars calling in from Toronto and Deborah Kenley calling in from Mississauga this afternoon. First up is Tim Van Cedars. He manages the Sustainable Technologies Evaluation Program, also known as STEP, at the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. He has over 12 years of experience designing and implementing stormwater technology, monitoring studies, and developing best practice guidance on the implementation, operation, and maintenance of these practices. Throughout his career, Tim has published several scientific reports and journal articles in the areas of water quality, hydrology, and low impact development stormwater management. He holds a master's degree specializing in hydrology from the University of Waterloo and a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Toronto. So, Tim, if you could take it on. Thanks very much, Alex. Perfect. OK, I'm going to just jump right in here then. Uh, so the, the low impact development or green infrastructure approach to stormwater management was developed primarily to address the impacts of urbanization on the water cycle. And to some extent also um, to address the failure of traditional stormwater management approaches to address these issues. So uh, when, a, as you can imagine, when a field or a forest is stripped to bare soil and developed with much higher impervious cover, the effects on the landscape are quite dramatic. We see a reduction in soil moisture storage, in rainfall interception by vegetation. The plants, um, to a large extent, aren't there anymore, so they're not evaporating or transpiring, so we see a reduction in evapotranspiration. And the biggest change we see is a reduction in surface infiltration with the increase in impervious cover. That translates into a much, much higher uh, rate of runoff and volume of runoff, anywhere between two and six times or even larger. The consequences of this higher runoff are uh, much higher stream flow volumes, higher peak flows, and lower base flows or low flows that happen uh, during the inter-event period. And that's because water is no longer infiltrating down and replenishing the groundwater table. The water table declines and the water doesn't seep into the uh, streams as it did uh, prior to the development. We also see with higher runoff, uh, much higher rates of bank and bed erosions in streams and uh, consequent loss of aquatic habitat. Yeah, higher runoff also increases the risk of floods. And I've included a picture here on the left. We have lots of pictures of flooding from our jurisdiction, but I, I thought this one on the left was particularly from Europe was particularly dramatic, so I included it here. Um, with that flooding comes a, a host of infrastructure damage. Uh, the picture I've shown here on the right is at Finch and Jane Avenue a few years ago during a large rain event. It's not, the infrastructure damage is often not so visible. Often it occurs in and around creeks. It could uh, be uh, damage to a uh, bridge abutment or there might have been a manhole that used to be beside the stream is now sitting right in the middle of the stream because the stream has wandered back and forth across the floodplain. Or it might be um, some storm uh, sewer infrastructure that was previously below the stream and is now being exposed and is in threat of being damaged. Millions and millions of dollars are spent by municipalities and ultimately taxpayers in, in correcting a lot of this damage. So it's a very expensive thing. The higher runoff also uh, contributes to degraded water quality. Um, Non-point urban stormwater is the largest source of contamination in two rivers and lakes. There's several studies that show that. And this uh, degraded water quality uh, exerts quite a lot of stress on aquatic life. The thermal impacts of superheated water coming off of pavements and roofs going into the rivers also exert stress on aquatic life. They're very sensitive to small temperature changes. 
The other types of thermal impacts relate to the heat island effect. In urban areas, the temperature uh, of urban areas are anywhere between 2 and 5 degrees Celsius higher than uh, they are outside of those areas. And that's because of all the black surfaces that absorb uh, heat, black roofs, uh, black pavements. In the uh, picture here on the right, you see a green roof here and a black roof here. Very different in terms of the amount of heat uh, that they absor absorb and emit. So a low impact development approach helps to prevent these issues and distinguishes itself from conventional stormwater management in its emphasis on reducing the volume of water through distributed and decentralized controls spread across the landscape. In new developments, the intent of LID is to work with the natural landscape and preserve natural drainage features rather than impose a cookie cutter approach without even considering the landscape that existed before. Instead of draining runoff as quickly as possible off the site, which occurs in a conventional uh, stormwater scenario, LID focuses on treating runoff close to the source, emphasizing temporary storage of water, long flow paths, low slopes that prevent runoff rather than uh, mitigating it. So many of the practices uh, that we're talking about today are very simple and cost effective. An open drainage sale, swale, like a, a vegetated swale, for instance, costs less than a curb and catch basin design, but provides better water quality treatment and contributes to the aesthetics of the site. But the benefits of low impact development aren't limited only to stormwater management, although these are quite significant. Uh, the practices can also help conserve water by creating a more absorbent landscape or by harvesting rainwater that can be used indoors. The plants can also contribute to improved habitat for living creatures, uh, improved air quality as plants are known to reduce particulates in the air and absorb carbon dioxide. Tree canopies, trees are sort of wonderful things uh, in and of themselves and the canopies they provide help to cool pavements and buildings thereby mitigating the heat island effect and reducing building energy costs. The practices are also uh, quite aesthetically uh, pleasing and can contribute to, as a result, higher land values. So the, the list of, of low impact development practices is pretty much as long as your imagination can stretch. A any practice or preventative technique that helps to reinstate natural water cycle by increasing detention, infiltration, evapotranspiration and storage could be considered as LID. Reducing the amount of impervious cover is one such technique, for instance, uh, by creating compact car spaces or using narrower roads or, or making uh, the surfaces more permeable uh, through permeable pavements. Other practices include bioretention, infiltration trenches, swales, Rainwater harvesting, green roofs, trees and tree boxes, um, different types of parking designs or street designs, increasing the amount of topsoil in pervious areas or adding compost to that soil can significantly reduce the amount of runoff generated from pervious areas. And so that also is a low impact development technique. So what, so what I'd like to uh, do now is just uh, take you through a few of the more common practices, uh, LID practices that we see with a focus on industrial commercial sites, applications in industrial commercial sites. So the first and, and definitely one of my favorite is uh, bioretention. Bioretention is a very flexible and adaptable practice as it comes in a variety of shapes and sizes and it can be adapted to suit many different development contexts. It uh, works best when designed to treat smaller drainage areas, around less than a hectare or so. It can be designed for full infiltration, partial or no infiltration, in which case it would also include an underdrain. Uh, it features basically an engineered sandy filter bed, uh, usually with mulch on top. Uh, that provides the growing media for the plants that are adapted to both wet and dry conditions as well as salt tolerance. It's typically designed to capture the smaller storm events, the storm events up to around 25 millimeters, although it can uh, capture larger events. 
and then it bypasses the larger events. Um, it, it's quite an attractive uh, landscaping feature and is uh, really well suited to ultra-urban areas. So this is also another type of bioretention. Uh, bio These are stormwater planters. Now stormwater planters are very similar in terms of the design. They also include overflow uh, capabilities and underdrains, uh, but they're typically um, closer to the building. So here you see a downspout connected to a bioretention area. In this uh, picture here, the, down, the roof is actually draining down into a kind of a, a grass, well, a concrete inlet then across the road through pipes into these bioretention areas. And these little planters are all connected. This one is connected to this one through pipes underground. This one's connected to that one. And this one is connected to this one here. And so all of these are, uh, it, you know, if the water fills up in one, it just transfers it to the next one down the line. Here's another example here with the uh, roof drainage draining down through some urban art into a, a rain barrel just really for aesthetic purposes and then into this bioretention area. This is a, a shopping mall. And that's my son there saying, oh, Dad, this is just really isn't that interesting. Let's just get going. Can't take this anymore. But I keep on telling him that this is really interesting. This is whole parking lot was completely done with LID um, and there were no storm sewers. Uh, permeable pavements are another iconic low-impact development practice. They come in a variety of different types. There's the poured variety, you have porous asphalt, and pervious concrete, as you see here. You can also um, get types of permeable pavements that are made of uh, recycled glass. A very common permeable pavement is the permeable interlocking concrete paver that you see here and here. So these allow water to drain through the pavement into an underlying stone reservoir where it's infiltrated into the native soil. It's typically used on low traffic roads, parking lots, driveways, plazas, and walkways. It's ideal for sites uh, with limited space for other surface practices. And um, it can reduce the amount of salt that you need to apply during the winter because the snow melts faster on permeable pavements because of the rapid drainage, uh, so there doesn't doesn't get there isn't as much ice buildup. It also has a natural friction to the surface, and that uh, prevents the need for as much salt as would otherwise be required. The rainwater harvesting is a more of a building integrated practice. It can range from rain barrels of uh, less than 400 liters to underground cisterns up to about 40,000 liters or even larger. The Ontario Building Code currently allows the use of rainwater for toilet urinal flushing and irrigation, as well uh, as, as some types of water used in plant processes for, on the commercial side. The systems are designed for uh, year-round use, really have to be located underground to prevent uh, damage from freezing, like this underground. This one here is in an underground parking garage. This one's actually under, underground out, outdoors. A lot of them are underground outdoors. And uh, these are very effective in reducing runoff volumes. They reduce about up, typically around 40% of the annual um, runoff from the roof. And they also help to conserve municipal water and uh, reduce water bills. So green roofs is another, uh, another practice that's uh, becoming more and more common and there's a lot more experience now um, in the GTA, in particular in Ontario, uh, with green roofs, and the costs are, are starting to come down as a result. Uh, most uh, green roofs that are put in are called extensive green roofs, uh, with a growing media between about three and six inches. They uh, can be installed on roofs with slopes up to 10%. Um, it reduces runoff annually by about 50% up to 90% in the summer and around uh, down to about 10% in the winter. And it does this entirely through evapotranspiration. It's returning that moisture back, into, back to the atmosphere. It also removes uh, most pollutants from, from roofs. So when we compare conventional roofs with green roofs, uh, we get much cleaner uh, runoff in most regards from uh, green roofs. 
It can has a number of other benefits as well. It can conserve energy by insulating the roof from heat and cold. Uh, it insulates the building interior from outside noise. Uh, it reduces heat, uh, urban heat island effect. One caveat with these uh, types of practice is that because the saturated weight of the roof is, is quite substantial, uh, the building upon which it's placed needs to have sufficient load-bearing capacity, and that can create a constraint in some industrial contexts. Infiltration trenches and chambers are also fairly common on uh, industrial commercial sites, or are becoming a bit more common anyways. There's really two varieties. There's the non-proprietary granular clear stone filled trench. So the clear stone is filled in here. The perforated pipe is then raised off the, the, the base to allow water to pond for a period of time and infiltrate. And then during the really large events, it can be conveyed um, off-site to avoid any uh, damage or any overflows or flooding. These are uh, relatively inexpensive systems. Treatment, pretreatment can be through a swale, such as here, or it can be through a catch basin or other means. The other type of, um, of type of infiltration uh, type system like this is the chambers, these uh, upside down U-shaped plastic structures. These allow for greater storage per unit area. So they uh, can reduce the amount of area you need uh, in order to, uh, to put these, and that uh, in turn can reduce costs. So these are also quite popular. Developers like them quite a lot because they're invisible on the surface, and you can develop right on top of it. So you can just put pavement right over the top, and uh, that's a huge benefit because you're not using build up buildable area. So in terms of costs, um, Often difficult to get really accurate costs on full LID designs. Um, we have some in Canada, but some of the best information is coming out of the United States uh, for a variety of different uh, full-scale LID designs uh, that they've incorporated there. The US EPA study cites about 15 to 80 percent lower costs for 11 of 12 full-scale LID applications uh, relative to conventional gray infrastructure. So they are seeing lower costs. The savings are primarily due to avoided costs. So the uh, avoided cost of having to put in a stormwater pond, or the avoided cost of uh, reducing the size of the stormwater pond. In some cases, you don't need as many pipes, or you can eliminate pipes altogether. Same thing with sidewalks, curbs, and gutters. You can save quite a lot. It might require less paving. You have narrow street, narrower streets or smaller parking stalls. Um, it also can reduce, be reduced by uh, not requiring other types of treatment devices on site, such as uh, oil grit separators. There's lower costs as well uh, if you're working with the natural landscape and using the natural contours of the landscape, building that into your site plan for uh, site grading and preparation. So you can save there. Um, if you don't have to put a, a pond at the surface, there can be a larger buildable area, and there's a huge, huge uh, savings uh, there, especially in the greater Toronto area where land is so expensive. And in many cases, these uh, low-impact development uh, practices are very simple in terms of long-term maintenance, and they can save uh, over the longer term when you do the life cycle cost analysis. That's uh, one of the things we've been working on over the last couple of years with the University of Toronto is the development of a life cycle costing tool. And that uh, tool, which is uh, based on standard costs, standard cost databases uh, for the local area, as well as uh, industry surveys, uh, you know, best, the best costs that we could po possibly come on up with right across from the planning stage to the site prep to the consultant fees to the design fees right to construction and implementation. And we've done these costs both in terms of the initial capital costs of a variety of different low impact development practices as well as the present value life cycle cost where the life cycle cost uh, shown in green there on the, on the graph includes annual maintenance plus rehabilitation over a 50-year period. We actually look at it over a 25- and 50-year period at a discount rate, in this case, of 5%. But of course, in the tool, you can change a lot of these values. 
We've done that for a lot of practices. The benefit values, because they're very difficult to estimate and controversial, uh, we didn't include those. Um, so this is really just the sort of infrastructure costs and not looking at the benefit values, only maintenance and rehabilitation. And here I've uh, compared three, four different scenarios uh, for green parking. One is a conventional non-green parking, just asphalt with old grit separator as treatment. The second is asphalt uh, that drains to a bioretention uh, with an underdrain, so that's a partial infiltration system, no uh, OGS required there. The yeah, third one is permeable pavement. It drains to asphalt with a permeable or the asphalt that drains the permeable pavement. So the asphalt in that case would be the same size as the permeable pavement. And an asphalt and um, infiltration trench where instead of uh, providing treatment with an OGS, you're providing treatment through a gravel biofilter, uh, which is very easy to maintain. And I'll show you this a couple of those a little later on. So no edge OGS required there as well. And what we see is that the capital cost, the initial capital cost of the asphalt and OGS scenario are slightly lower than some of the others. But when you look at the life cycle costs, the permeable pavement and infiltration trench is actually lower than the asphalt and OGS example. And the bioretention isn't much more expensive. If that was a full infiltration bioretention, it would be actually lower than the asphalt case. So what, I, what I'd like to do now is just take you through a case study. This is the Honda uh, headquarters in, in Markham. The architects on it were Zass Hoff Architects. The landscape architect was Scholen and Company. And uh, I'll just give oral credit for, to uh, Mark Scholen for providing a lot of pictures for this portion of the uh, presentation. And Sabrin Kimball and Associates was the water resources engineer. So the objectives of this uh, development uh, in terms of stormwater management was to improve water quality, provide some water conserva uh, good water conservation, maintain the pre-development of water balance, and minimize to the extent, extent possible reliance on end of pipe stormwater control. So do as much of the treatment on site as possible. Uh, other objectives were to optimize efficiencies uh, wherever possible, utilize the landscape as a functional system, uh, particularly with regards to the stormwater and to meet Honda's sustainability vision and very clean, kind of minimalistic aesthetic. And of course, a lot of this was sort of driven by the LEED process, because for a lot of the stormwater me management measures that you'll see, LEED provides a points in the certification process, and they wanted to achieve LEED certification on this site. This was um, it's about a three-year-old site. It was done, uh, completed about three years ago. So this is just the site plan here. This is the production and distribution center. This is the loading bay here. The parking all the way through here. This is a field uh, and the office is on in and through here. So we have about a 4.6 hectare roof area and the parking lot area uh, is, uh, can accommodate over a thousand vehicles. In terms of the stormwater management plan, uh, a variety of different low impact development uh, measures were implemented on the site. We have here the roof draining to a rainwater cistern over here, and then the cistern overflows during when it's full uh, to an overflow pond, as does this biofilter here. We have uh, permeable pavements in the roundabout, right in the front courtyard area, as well as permeable pavement, all of these gray bits here. All well, these gray things are permeable pavements as well in the parking lot just to provide a little bit more infiltration. And we have a vegetated swale and rock swales along the back. But the sort of primary water quality and quantity treatment mechanism on the site was through this integrated network of biofilters. All of these blue strips here are biofilters. And uh, most of the runoff is being sent into these biofilters. So the way these work here is you have a bio, uh, an inlet, it's a gravel inlet, water flows into the inlet, and then infiltrates down into the trench where there's a perforated pipe. Perforated pipe is raised in the cross section, so you have a little bit of a ponding area for smaller events. It would pond here and then the water would infiltrate. And during larger events, the perforated pipe is undersized, so it allows water to pond and uh, be stored temporarily inside the trench, thus reducing peak flows. 
it's, uh, this whole design was designed to accommodate 100-year storms. It's one of the very few um, LID site designs that is actually designed for flood flows. And the idea here was that they didn't want to have a, a pond on the site. So if you look back at this here, they would have had to put a pond right here. And that was going to take up a lot of land area. Instead, they were allowed to get away with a much smaller area for the pond. Okay, here's just a few site photos. This is the natural drainage area just off the offices. It's uh, interlocking pavers. Uh, these are not permeable ones. They flow into the tree islands as well as into the uh, vegetated areas along the perimeter. And this is uh, all with native plants. These are the permeable pavers in the parking lot. These little strips I showed you uh, in plan view before. There's the rainwater cistern, um, a drainage swale and fitness path for uh, employees to run during the day. And here's the biofilter uh, inlet that I showed you in the schematic before. So it's a nice river stone. It looks rather, you know, it doesn't look unattractive at all. And then these side areas are very heavily vegetated. You don't really see that here. So here's some more permeable pavers in the uh, roundabout, the forecourt roundabout. Bike stalls for staff, landscape, outdoor areas. It's a very, uh, it's a very pretty site. So. Uh, in terms of cost, at the conceptual design stage, the initial cost estimate showed that the LID approach would cost about 10% more than a conventional approach, which Honda didn't mind too much, I believe, because they were uh, looking at having uh, getting LEED certification, and that was part of their uh, that was part of their intention. When factoring in the value of the land where the pond would have been, however, um, the scheme generated a net savings of 5%. So that's really uh, the end of my presentation. I just wanted to point you to some local resources that we have uh, on low impact development. Uh, perhaps most important is the uh, Stormwater Management Planning and Design Guide that's based on local conditions and, and uh, has a lot of great information in it. Uh, we update that uh, on occasion. The next update is planned, I think, for uh, next year. Uh, the life cycle uh, costing tool that I mentioned earlier will be available on the TRCA website uh, April 2013. That's the sustainabletechnologies.ca website. Uh, you'll find a lot of guidance, LID monitoring, case studies, and resources available at both the TRCA sustainabletechnologies.ca website as well as the CDC Low Impact Development website. And we also have maps. So if you're interested in going and see some, seeing some LID that has been implemented close to where you work uh, for Ontario, we have the iSwim map. It's mostly GTA at the moment, but we're uh, working on building that out. And then for CDC and their jurisdiction, the Green Projects map, and that's on the CDC uh, website above. Or uh, if you're interested, just call or email us. Where we provide uh, professional support for planning, designing, monitoring, and implementing LID projects. Um, uh, through the uh, Sustainable Technologies Group, as well as through CDC's Leaders for Clean Water program. And that's our contact information. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Tim. That was a really great overview. Um, of course, if you guys have any questions on low impact development, you can talk, contact Tim, sorry, Tim Van Seers, and his contact information is there, and also Chris Despins from Credit Valley Conservation. Um, Tim, if I can ask you to switch slides right now. We wanted to give you an overview of some of the progr programming that Partnership Project Green offers to engage your employees and also restore public and private land. Um, so we do have a corporate tree planting program, which has two parts to it. Um, and then we also have breeding corporate grounds. So for the tree planting program, the first option is the annual spring and fall corporate planting events. Tim, if I can actually ask you to switch again and go to the next slide. There we go. So these we offer two times in a year, one in the fall and one in the spring. If you could go back one, that would be great. Right. Um, and it's really a great, event, a, a great event filled with fun, and it's really great. Everyone brings their families, and it's free with a great barbecue. And we also offer, if you want to do something just for your company, um, it's a uh, it's a customized planting event for your organization, and you choose a date, and we provide a series of opportunities. Now, if you can switch to the next slide, Tim, that would be greatly appreciated. And 
what we do offer is all the materials, waivers, and safety equipment. And in 2012, we actually had SHARP and TD take advantage of this program, and they really enjoyed it. Um, so if you have any questions about that, you can always email admin at partnersofprojectgreen.com. So for the last option, we have the Greening Corporate Grounds Program um, that the Credit Valley Conservation offers. And I'm just going to switch presenters now. So if you can excuse me for the quick um, pause here, I'm just going to find Deborah. And she's going to upload her presentation. Um, so the Greening Corporate Grounds Program is delivered by Credit Valley Conservation on behalf of Partners of Project Green. Um, and Deborah Kenley will go in more depth in, in what the program offers. Deborah is, uh, has a master's in landscape architecture and extensive experience as a residential and corporate landscape designer who is currently engaging corporations and institutions in ecological landscaping projects through Credit Valley Conservation Screening Corporate Grounds Program. Deborah is also a seasoned coordinator of continuing education programs and certifications for design professionals and has worked for both the Ontario Association of Architectures and OCAD University. So if you could just give me one second, I'm going to find Deborah and unmute her so she could go on with her presentation. Okay, hello everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about the Greening Corporate Grants Program. Um, and if I could just get my computer to... There we go. Um, it's a little bit slow on this end. So um, just in case you don't know who Credit Valley Conservation is or where we are. So um, we are a conservation authority. And our jurisdiction basically runs from um, Orangeville all the way down to Lake Ontario. So that we're pretty much the neighboring conservation authority to TRCA. Um, so about the Greening Corporate Grounds program, um, it was developed by Credit Valley Conservation and Evergreen Canada, and it actually started in 2009. So we have been doing projects mainly in Mississauga and um, Brampton for the last few years. And what we do is we help uh, corporations, businesses, um, places of worship green their grounds. And it doesn't really matter whether you know the property is actually leased or owned. We have the ability to work with. Um, you know, all different types of, of landowners. So it's a completely voluntary program. And, um, you know, we really just want to get people out there and help them achieve ecological goals on their, pro on their property. So overall, the idea is to help reduce maintenance costs and, you know, generally improve the environment and the quality um, of the plantings on the site. So um, how we work is that we work directly with the landowner um, or you know, the corporation who's actually leasing, and we'll develop a custom concept plan for your site. So it's all individual, it's not cookie cutter. Um, we provide educational resources such as workshops and guides, and we'll actually go ahead and do uh, planting events if, if people are interested. So we'll coordinate a planting event with your staff on your site, and um, basically we can do that, or we could also do other types of events, um, you know, like if you have a, a green, you know, an Earth Day or um, event or something like that, we can come out and speak or have a table or, you know, just be there to help support the projects that you're actually implementing on your site. So, um, you know, we do offer technical advice also. So we we can work with your landscape consultants or in-house personnel because um, we know sometimes it's difficult. Not everybody understands, um, you know, these types of projects. So we do try to communicate that to people who who may be maintaining the sites going forward. Um, we'll also, you know, provide resources for um, all the plants and the materials that are required for the events. And if necessary, um, you know, we'll recommend consultants if the project does get, you know, a little more involved and you find that you need a very detailed design or you need to, you know, you need an engineer, we can, we can help you with that process as well. And um, another benefit of joining the program is that um, we provide program recognition, so we try to promote you know, the people who are actually participating. So we'll, you know, we'll promote you on our website and, um, you know, through articles and other things that we are actually, um, you know, that we'll write. And um, we also do have an awards uh, program. So we hope that, you know, our participants, um, you know, will win awards for, for the work that they're doing. So in terms of program costs, 
um, there are no actual fees to participate in the program. So what you'll be getting is, you know, the concept plan, um, plant lists, um, you know, general site information and support um, for these for these um, projects. And um, the only thing that we do ask is that participants cover the cost for the actual construction of of the project, so plants and mulch. Um, and that sort of thing. Um, but we do provide an estimate in advance, so you're not really going into things blind. So, um, you know, we'll provide you with costs on how much the plant materials are going to cost. Um, we can also phase the project for you, so there's no pressure to really take on more than you can actually, let's say, afford or, or that you're willing to budget for. And we can phase, phase the projects over a number of years. So it's, you know, it's entirely flexible and we can work with you um, in any way that is you know, that is most comfortable. And in terms of savings, um, you know, we do try to negotiate savings from some of the suppliers that we work with. They're very often willing to pass on, um, you know, a discount to our participants. And um, also, if you do have a planting event, very often you'll end up saving on the installation costs because, you know, your staff will be out there having fun and planting, and um, so you don't really have to hire a consultant or landscape crew to actually um, install it, although sometimes we find that the landscape crews are, are working side by side with with the actual staff members, and it works out really great. And um, over the long term, um, you know, there is an establishment phase, so usually within three years. And uh, maintenance costs generally go down radically after that because the types of, um, you know, the types of habitats that we do recommend basically don't require as much maintenance um, going forward. So. Let me just go to the next slide. Sorry, it's a little slow here. OK. So how the program works. So essentially, there is a structure to the program. Um, we have different categories that help you customize your program. So you can choose projects that involve, you know, that are in what we call the land category. So you can choose woodland gardens, prairies, meadows, um, you know, wildlife habitat features, um, green roofs, green walls, and fences. We also have a number of um, water projects that you can that you can choose from, which does also include some LID um, projects that were mentioned earlier. Um, education and access is also a really big part of the program, so we do like to explain what we're doing um, and have that information passed off to staff. So, um, you know, um, workshops about you know native plantings and habitat, and also if you if you have a big enough property that can include trails or signs or or that sort of thing, that that's always really um, a benefit. And then ongoing maintenance is also a really important part of the program because once you do install these these projects, then it is important that they are maintained. So um, you know we do have a support system for that to ensure that you're doing you know what needs to be done to um, so that these these types of landscapes actually thrive, and overall, you know, reducing the amount of water that you're using on the site by including things like low maintenance lawn, lawns, and other types of um, sustainable practices on your site. So there are program levels. So um, essentially, there are there are benchmarks that help you know both us and you sort of monitor your you know monitor your um, uh, your progress throughout the program. So, um, you know, basically there's turquoise, jade, and emerald, and it just means that, you know, you are working on different projects and adding more projects over time. So if you did want to, if you did want more information about the tif different types of projects that you can actually um, get involved with through the program, I've provided a link here. So that will take you to our checklist, which explains how the program works in a little more detail. Um, but in terms of getting started, so if a corporation did want to get started on a program like this, um, the minimum requirements is basically just to complete one project in either the land or water category. So you could take on something as small as, you know, a pollinator garden, which would encourage things like butterflies and birds um, and a lot of native species. Um, or you could do something a little more involved. Um, 
like bioretention um, or something like a prairie meadow, which would involve just leaving, you know, maybe part of your land, um, stop mowing it, and then overseed with some native species. So, you know, it's fairly, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, it can be a small project or a, a large project to begin with. Um, so in terms of the benefits to participation, you know, there are, we're finding that there are a lot of benefits. I mean, generally, you know, it, there's the aesthetic benefit, um, but also demonstrating that you're a leader in sustainability. So a lot of um, participants and, you know, partners in Project Green are doing a lot in terms of energy efficiency and things on the inside of the building. So um, this is really demonstrating on the outside that, that this is something that you, the corporation, actually cares about. Um, overall, you know, you do save on maintenance costs, and um, it's also a really nice compliment if you do have a corporate um, social responsibility program. This is something that that kind of goes hand in hand with it. Um, and another thing is that um, you know there are a lot of benefits to the environment as well. You know, obviously from our perspective, we're we're really interested in that. So increasing you know the number of plants and animals and and overall um, habitat on your site is really important. Um, you know, water you know, improving the water quality, um, conserving resources. And um, we're also finding that, that staff really um, appreciate um, these types of landscapes and will actively use them throughout the day and do take responsibility for, for the types of projects. So we do have um, some corporations where people actually go out on their lunch hour and they'll weed or deadhead or, or do things like that. And, and they really appreciate the opportunity to, um, to get out there. Um, so I just wanted to bring your attention to, um, you know, a study that would, that just came out actually um, in, I think it was in December, and it's by Terrapin Bright Green, and um, they, they wrote um, an article on basically, um, you know, natural habitat and economics and the benefits to business. And so there are a lot of really good, uh, there's a lot of really good information there. And I've included the link um, in the presentation so that you can take a look at it. But um, really, uh, you know, it's, it's a very important component to, to healthy business, just having access to, to, um, to the landscape throughout the day um, improves overall morale and health. And, um, you know, I put this in sort of as an example, and this is actually in Brampton, where you can see a fairly, you know, I mean, this is an extreme example, but this isn't, it's not that it's not typical, um, but we are finding that a lot of, a lot of companies um, have a fairly barren exterior, um, you know, harsh, you know, sunlight, you know, people have to pull the blinds down, there's no screening, the grass is completely dead or dormant or burnt and um, it's not really a very you know inviting place to go to work and uh, there are some statistics that say that um, you know having a connection to nature actually improves attendance of employees so um, I think it is it is an important thing to include as part of your overall business strategy so um, I did want to present a couple of case studies. So the first one is Fielding Chemical Technologies, and um, they were an early adopter of the program back in 2009. And um, they're located in Mississauga, and um, they have a particularly harsh site. So there's an aggregate company across the street, so they're constantly getting dust floating over from um, you know, from the road, it's very windy, the soils are extremely compacted, um, and it, it's really just a very, very harsh, harsh environment. And over the last few years, they've started to create a bit of a buffer, so you can sort of see in the image that they've created um, almost like a U around the front entrance, and they're going to be putting in a, um, an outdoor boardroom, so it'll be a gazebo where people can actually go outside and congregate, and they can have meetings within the natural space that they've created. Um, I've included some of the costs in here uh, for the types of projects that they've done. And um, so you can see that they, they started off fairly small, and uh, the most that they actually spent on, on, you know, a planting event was, you know, just over $1,600. So, you know, over time, again, you know, we're flexible. We can work with whatever budget that you do have um, in order to improve, you know, your site. So the other case study is Colliers International. And um, they are, I don't know if anybody's familiar, just across from square one, there are four buildings. So this is the MEC one to four buildings. And they started off with a parking lot project. So these are planter boxes that are in um, 
in the upper deck of their parking lot, and they're actually quite large. So we went ahead and did a bunch of um, um, a bunch of planting within the planter boxes. So this is what it looked like before. So this is um, basically just you know half dying, um, <laughs> really you know exposed and um, not very attractive planter box in the parking lot. And um, you know today this is what it looks like. So the staff in the building and also the adjacent condos, they have an opportunity to view uh, what's going on in the parking lot and it's, it's quite an improvement. And they actually spent a little bit more on this project. So this initial planting project was around $3,000, but they did uh, pack a lot into it and the benefits. And this was actually just in one season. So this all, this all grew um, in one season. So it was great. So to date, these are the, the businesses that are, and institutions that are uh, currently participating in the program. And um, you can see that we do have you know, uh, companies of all different sizes from you know, fairly small to extremely large and international. And we also include um, you know, churches and, and institutions. So um, everyone is, is really welcome to participate. And this is a list of our program partners and supporters. And if you wanted to get in touch with me, then um, here I am. Okay, thank Great. you. Great, thank you so much, Deborah. Um, now, any questions that any of the participants might have? I haven't really seen anything that, come, that came through during the presentation. So if you want to have any questions, Tim and um, Deborah are both here, um, and bef if you want to maybe type in some, that would be great. And while we do that, I just really want to thank everyone for participating. And um, on behalf of PPG and, and our sponsors, our webinar partners, Green and Greater Toronto, Butter Buildings Partnership, Canada Green Building Council, Greater Toronto Chapter, and Hydro One Brampton, we thank you again for joining us. Uh, we hope you found the information of value. And if, it, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us at admin at partnershipprojectgreen.com. Um, so we have a question here. So is the same corporate group screening program available in Toronto? Um, it's through Evergreen, and um, who originally started the program with CVC. And uh, they are doing it as fee-for-service. You may find the, the structure a little bit different, but it's essentially the same, the same program. OK, great. Any other questions that anyone might have? And how about, is it also available in Pickering? I'm not really sure. Again, um, that would be a question for Evergreen to see how far they would take it. They, they, may, they will take it across Canada. I just don't know if they have it up and running across Canada yet, but that is essentially the, um, that's the plan. Mm -hmm. Now, Tim, you might have an answer to this question. Does TRCA have any residential programs? Um, Residential programs, yes. Well, through the stewardship group, we, we do have a residential programs where we assist uh, um, assist homeowners uh, with implementing a low impact development. Uh, so yes, we do as well. Uh, there is these um, sustainable neighborhood, uh, the SNAPs. Um, so if you're in a SNAP neighborhood, uh, there would be much stronger support uh, for residents in those areas. Okay. But I think uh, we could follow up uh, with, uh, on that question and provide an appropriate contact if you're interested. Okay, that sounds great. And I know they, they were great in providing an overview of both the LID technology and the programming that's available. Um, has, and does, do we have any other questions? Or would Tim or Deborah would like to say anything extra? Um, I think there's a question there on the maintenance. Yeah. There, there is a question on the maintenance, implication costs, and installing LED pavers or pavements. Okay. I don't, I don't have those numbers, but. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's me. Uh, so the pavers, uh, the maintenance costs. Uh, typically, you would be required to uh, maintain the pavers uh, with a vacuum-assisted sweeper uh, once a year. Uh, we found that we've had pavers in for two to three years, and they still maintain um, their infiltration properties in the beginning. But after after a bit of time, the, the infiltration, uh, the surface infiltration, does decrease. So it's recommended that that be done every year, and it costs depending on the size of the site. But for a about a 2,000 square meter area, 
probably in the area of 1,000 to 1,500 per year. Perfect, great. Now, uh, are there any other questions? Because I couldn't see that question, so there might be something visible. But uh, we will send out the contact details of all presenters. So we do have a question to get uh, Tim's email up again, and we will do that mm -hmm. in the email. Um, I'm seeing a couple of more questions, and there's there's one with respect to native plants and salt. Okay, great. So um, I'm happy to answer that, and the, and, and the answer to that is it varies. So there are a number of native plant species that will tolerate salt, but um, you know obviously the the objective is to reduce you know the amount of salt that you're using on the property. But we know that's not always realistic. So um, when we are working in a an area that does um, you know get inundated with salt, then we will we'll keep that in mind and try to choose species that will that will thrive. Yeah, and we've, uh, we've also seen a number of examples of bioretention where the road runoff is draining into the bioretention area. It has lots and lots of plants that are specially designed for salt tolerance, and these uh, are surviving very well over time. So we, we've seen this uh, work quite, uh, quite well. Mm -hmm. And then there's a question um, for, about Norway maples, and yeah. how do you deal? Is that invasive? It is invasive. It's actually um, a, one of the one of the top invasive species that that we've identified. And um, you know what we're recommending is it's it's ideal to to remove them. Um, they have uh, they generate a lot of seed pods that that are you know <laughs> really you know they just travel and um, they get into the to the streams, and um, they're they're a very a very difficult species to deal with. So what we do recommend is that they be removed whenever possible, and replaced with something something more suitable and native whenever possible. So the other opportunity is if you can't remove it, then just try to sweep up, you know, rake up all of the uh, the seed pods as soon as they land. That's that's another way to deal with it. Perfect. Are there any other questions on your end, Tembra or Tim? No, I don't see anything. Perfect. Well, thank you again for attending, and thank you to Deborah and Tim for joining us and for providing a great uh, presentation. Have a wonderful afternoon, and we will be sending the details out very sh uh, shortly.